I'm going to listen to the 400. That was his final mistake. Not only was he not victorious, but he ends up losing his life. What is the application for us today? I want to ask ourselves a question if we can this morning. And, and I'll, I'll phrase it like this. What is the basis on which you and I accept or reject information? Okay. What is the basis? What's the criteria that we use where we say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll have that. Or we say, oh no, no, I, don't, I just don't accept that. Now, if you speak to somebody who isn't a Christian, they might say, well, all depends whether it sounds logical, or all depends whether it sounds reasonable or plausible. You know, if it sounds, if it, if it ticks all those boxes, then I might accept it. Yeah, if it doesn't, then I'll reject it. Now, if you talk to a Christian, they might say, yes, I agree with that, but I'm also going to add something else. I'm going to say, it has to line up with the Word of God. You know, if someone's telling me something, I'm receiving this information. It's got to line up with the Word of God. Or, uh, and if it does, then I'll accept it. And that's right for Christians, you know, the, the, the sole rule of faith and practice is the Bible, the Word of God. But it's a little bit simplistic. Let me tell you why. Let's say, for example, somebody comes up to me and says, Paul, I think you've got a real problem with pride. I, I think you're full of pride, you know, and I think you ought to do something about it. Now, I can't just say, oh, well, I'll just go to the Bible and see if that's true. I'm going to do something else. Now, if I go to the Bible, the Bible will tell me that pride is a sin and that it's wrong and I ought not to be prideful. But it won't tell me whether I am prideful unless I take those principles and those words and I make a personal application of them to my heart, right? I've got to, I've got to look inside, haven't I? I've got to examine my heart. I've got to examine my intents. I've got to examine my motives. I've got to examine my actions and so on and say, well, is that true? Is that true? So as we, we look today at, at, at this, this lesson from the life of King Ahab, as we consider the reason why we accept or reject information, I'm going to split it up into three, three main reasons why people might reject the word of the Lord. Just like Ahab did. Uh, uh, the first one is this. They might reject the word of the Lord because it doesn't make you feel good. You ever had that word? You feel the Lord spoken to you, and you know sometimes the Lord speaks and, and you feel comforted. Sometimes the Lord speaks and you think, well, that's so wonderful. And maybe I've got to write that down even. God has blessed me so much. At other times the Lord speaks, and it's not that feeling, is it? You feel uncomfortable. God has put his finger on something in your life. And you think, yeah, that, that, that makes me feel, uh, uh, I'm sort of disquieted inside. I, I mean, you know, uh, it, God has touched something in my life now. And I know I've got to do something about it. It's not necessarily a nice feeling, is it? I'm a King Ahab's words. When he talked about uh, uh, Micaiah, the prophet, I hate him, for he does not prophesy good concerning me. It's not something good. He's telling me things. I, I hate him because whenever he tells me something, it's always something bad. But you know why? Because Ahab is continuing in sin all the time. That's why it's something bad. That's why he's being condemned by the prophet Micaiah. Come on, sit down. That's why he's being condemned by the prophet Micaiah. Because his life isn't right with the Lord. That's why it's always something bad. But you know, today people are saying, well, the church ought to be having a positive message. It ought to be saying something positive. The church ought not to be talking about death and hell and judgment and all these kind of things. Because it doesn't sit well with people. It makes them feel uncomfortable. You know, the church is not going to be very popular. But you know, the idea of a popular message, whether it's positive or negative is really a 20th or 21st century concept. If you go back, if you go back into the church's history, death, hell, judgment, all these things were part of life. And were part of, you know, if you go to a very old church, you know, one's old church buildings, and you, you walk in there, 
What is it that's surrounding the whole church? Almost every single one. Dead bodies, yeah, graves, isn't it? It's a constant reminder that death is coming, and after that, what? The judgment. You can't walk in or walk out of those buildings without looking around and being reminded of your own mortality. That this isn't it, that there's something beyond this. Something beyond this, that there's a God you're going to have to stand before in judgment. And I've had people say to me, oh, well, why don't we just be like Jesus and talk about the love of God? Well, you know, when Jesus speaks to the world, to those who are unsaved, just about the only place he talks about the love of God is John 3.16. Perhaps it's significant that that's the, the passage that everybody talks about, that everybody even remembers. But, you know, most of the time, what's he talking about? Sin, death, hypocrisy, the coming judgment. If you look at the life of Jesus, you read it for yourself. Go through the Bible, look how many times Jesus is talking about those things. Nothing to do whether it's negative or positive. We want to know, is it true? Is it the truth? If it's positive, great. But it's got to be true. It's not going to be some positive message, but it's not true. Then I'm walking in a delusion, aren't I? I, I I'm believing something that isn't real. Then the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus says, I, I'm going to send you a comforter. Now, I'm going to promise you uh, to send you this comforter. What does the comforter talk to the people about? What is his message? Have a look. Uh, Gospel of John 16. Just briefly turn there. Gospel of John 16 and verse 8. And when he, he being the Holy Spirit here, when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Well, wow. how about that? The same message that Jesus is bringing. Sin, righteousness, judgment. These have been common Christian themes throughout the last 2,000 years. It's only now they're very unpopular. They're unfashionable. And yet they're, they're part of Christ's message. You know, Peter Hitchens, who is the, the brother of the late Christopher Hitchens, Peter Hitchens is a Christian, by the way, he said this, Death, death, the fear of it and what lies beyond have been shoved to the edges of our lives, postponed until later. Much like worrying about pension in your 20s. Don't worry about it now. It's going to come much, much later. You know, in the old days, Victorian times and so on, mortality was very much uh, uh, attended. That's why I had such big families. Not all your children would make it. To adulthood. Negative preaching isn't popular in churches. But if we're not careful, we fall into the same error that King Ahab made. And we believe the positive message just simply because it's positive. And we reject the negative message just simply because it was negative. And therefore we didn't like it. We might reject the word of the Lord because it's too challenging. Just turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Bring in a few scriptures now. Gospel of Mark and uh, chapter 10. Mark 10, verse 17. Uh, and when he, he being Jesus, was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Now notice the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not, honour thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. 
Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. It wasn't what he wanted to hear. He said, Lord, I've done this, and I've done that, and look, look how good I've been. I've, you know, I, I, I've not committed adultery, I've not, I've not done any of these things. Jesus says, yeah, but there's this one thing that you lack. You know, that was the one thing that he didn't want to give to God. Maybe it's the same with us sometimes. God says, yeah, there's one thing lacking in your life, one thing you've got to do. And you say, oh no, Lord, you can have everything else, but, but I want to keep this for myself. Sometimes the word of the Lord can be a uh, challenge. God might be uh, challenging to us. God might be asking us to make changes in our lives. He might be asking us to make radical changes, fundamental changes in the way that we live. In fact, I put it to you that anybody whose life has not been fundamentally changed has not met God. Because that's the nature of God. He makes changes in people's lives. When you become a Christian, you've got to make those changes. Or rather, you've got to allow God to make those changes through you and in you. King Ahab rejected God's message because it meant he would have to change his plans. He couldn't have that which he was coveting. He couldn't have it. So, rather than change his ways, he changed the messenger, didn't he? Rather than listen to that messenger, no, I'll listen to these prophets here. I'll listen to these four hundred instead. He changed the message. He turned his ears from the truth and turned unto fables. 2 Timothy 4, verse 4. He changed and therefore he exchanged the truth of God into a lie. Romans 1, 25. And it cost him his life. So we might reject the word of the Lord because it's just too challenging for us. Finally, another reason why we might reject the word of the Lord is it's not what everybody else is saying. 400 prophets said, go up, go up for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Only one prophet said, let them return every man to his house in peace. 1 Kings 22, 17. The other, the other prophets were saying, yeah, go up, you'll be victorious. You'll win a mighty victory. The Lord is with you. You're going in the right direction. But one person, one person said, no, don't do it. All the way through the scriptures, it's a remnant theology. It's the smaller part. It was a remnant of humanity that was saved in the ark. It was a remnant that gathered themselves to Moses' side in Exodus 32, 26. And it is a remnant of God's people here that are loyal to the house of David. The majority, the ten tribes, were disloyal. The ten tribes under, under the, that whole, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, all those kings that word? I can't think of that. <laughs> that, all, all those, the, the, that whole kind of, uh, uh, no, I can't think what the word is now. Anyway, you know what I mean? But that whole, all that, that list of, of kings, the kings of Israel, all of them have rejected the Lord. And it's amazing to me that Ahab, a wicked king, right at the end of his, his uh, dynasty, that's the word, Right at the end of his uh, life, God is still giving him a chance. He's still, he's still giving him a chance to at least preserve his life. But he says no. See, there's some people who think that God will just keep on giving them another chance, and another chance, and another chance. But the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord will not strive with man forever. You know, he 
cannot mock God. 400 prophets said it'll be okay. One prophet said it won't. But Ahab went with majority decision. Majority decision. Do you know, it is completely irrelevant what the majority say when it comes to establishing truth, particularly biblical truth. It is totally irrelevant. You know, if you lived in, uh, you know, it's in the problem we've got because we live in a democracy, right? And everything's like, you know, let's vote on it. Okay, majority wins. And I, mean, I think it gets into our, our minds a bit, this sort of idea, well, if enough people agree, it must be right. Okay, well, not necessarily. You know, if you lived in, in say, uh, Nazi Germany in the 30s, you know, Hitler was brought into power through majority vote, through democratic means. Does that mean that his policies were right and morally good? Of course not. Morally abhorrent, but majority put him in power. So whether you know it's the majority or the minority is kind of irrelevant. Is is it true? Objective objective moral values are always morally right, regardless of who accepts or rejects them. Yeah. The values of the Bible, the moral laws of the Bible, will always be true. Regardless of who finds them acceptable or who does not, that's totally irrelevant. If they come from God, which I believe they have, then they will always be true. Objective biblical truths are always true, regardless of who accepts them or rejects them. That's why I don't lose any sleep over what's fashionable in the church today or what's unfashionable in the church. I've been a Christian for more than 30 years. I've seen fashions come and go. I've seen things popular and then unpopular. I don't care about that. I want to know what's the truth. What's the word of the Lord? What's the message of the Lord to me as a Christian? What's the message of the Lord to us as a congregation, as a church? That's what we want to know. What's the truth? As a Christian, you should develop a real hunger and a thirst for the truth and for righteousness. And not be swayed by this fashion and that fashion in the church that's irrelevant. Don't want to make the mistake that Ahab made. Does it feel good? Does it make me feel good? Is it not too challenging? Or is it what everybody else is saying? Well, it might not be. It might not be what everybody else is saying. Apostle Paul said, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4, verse 16. When you preach the gospel to non Christians, sometimes you become something of their enemy. That's how they regard you. They think you're having a go at them. They think you're. You're, you're being unpleasant, you're being unkind to them. In fact, all you're doing is, is sharing the truth with them. You're just telling them this is what God says. This is what God has said. This is what is going to happen. Just like the prophet, Micaiah there. This is what's going to happen. Okay? It's not a question of uh, you know, not become your enemy just because I'm telling you the truth. So the question is not, is the message negative? Is the message <coughs> challenging? Does everybody agree with the message? The question is, is it true? And is it from the Lord? If it is true, if it is from the Lord, then don't make Ahab's mistake. Heed the word of the Lord. Let's pray. <coughs> Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your, your word, for the scriptures. Lord, I thank you for your, your blessings to us as a fellowship, Lord, and to me as a pastor. Lord, thank you so much for all your goodness to me, Lord. And just pray that you would continue to lead us 
as a fellowship uh, in the truth, in the way of your spirit. In Jesus' name.